Thirudra Chowdhury. Welcome to In Conversation. Lynn, thank you so much for having me. Is India trying to yank the center of gravity of Asia towards New Delhi, away from Beijing? Not at all. A, I don't think that's an intention of any government in India. And B, I think it's outside of the strategic need for India. Why would India need to yank Asia outside of China's sphere of influence? I think for India, the most important thing is to have an Asia and members of an ASEAN um, who it can cooperate with, both bilaterally as well as within the ASEAN group, a group that India has invested a huge amount of political capital in from the early 1990s onwards. And today, there is a myriad of ways in which India deals with the ASEAN on culture, on technology, on the economy, on industry. So I think the hope for India is to do much more with Asia, to do, do much more with ASEAN countries. But I don't think the strategic vision is to pull it, uh, the ASEAN away from China. But what about India sending four warships? They're going to be deployed into the South China Sea. Now, the other thing is India is also taking actively part in the Quad, which is a US-based or US-led security alliance. Why now? Doesn't that say something about what India wants to do? I think that says more about India's strategic growth than it says about trying to extrapolate that growth with ASEAN or Asia in mind. And I'll break that down in two ways. One is India's invested in the Indo-Pacific now for the last many, many years. Although the Indo-Pacific term has kind of become more faddish, if you like, in the last sort of five or six years. And it's not just an investment in its maritime capabilities, but it's an investment on the economy. It's an investment in working on with littoral states. It's an investment in new diplomatic formulations such as the trilateral between Australia, France, and India in working on infrastructure development, port abrogation, looking at norms of illegal fisheries. So I think there is an investment in the Indo-Pacific, but I don't think that investment is necessarily to yank sort of Asia into an Indian sphere of influence. I think there are strategists here who are smart enough to realize that that's not gonna be possible. ASEAN nations by definition are nationalist nations. I think that history is very clear and it is that understanding of history, which for India goes back to right at the birth of this independent country in the late forties. I mean, the first major conference that India had was Asia. But Rudra, warships is very different from trade. Why send warships? So there is, I mean, look, Lynn, I think it's very clear that with the with Chinese behavior turning on its head over the last one, one and a half decades, but perhaps in a more pronounced way since about 2012, there is a need for India to establish its own sphere of influence in larger parts of the Indo-Pacific. So at the moment, India's maritime capabilities and investments are very much in the Indian Ocean region. But over time, I have no doubt, through partners and friends alike, it'll push out to different parts of the Indo-Pacific as a whole. Um, but that's very much, I think, keeping sort of Indian interests in mind. I'm not, I'm not quite convinced by the argument that it's designed to kind of pull any other part of the world into this formulation. Is India becoming a pawn of the United States in its US-China rivalry? Rick Lane, I think as you know, as well as I, for anyone who st studied India for the last 200 years, and especially since 1947, this country is just not designed to be a pawn of anyone, especially post-47, right? So I think um, there are many who would argue within India, perhaps, that that's exactly what's happening. But if you just look at the historical DNA of India from the 50s onwards, it's always found a space between what's called great power rivalry without necessarily having to put all its bets into one basket. So whether that's Russia or whether that's the United States or whether for a temporary period from the late 80s onwards, it was China. So I think it's a country that in many, many ways figures itself out without necessarily partners. I'll give you one example. Think of any other country that has strong strategic ties with Russia, Iran, the United States, and the European Union at the same time with almost the same amount of investment, political investment. But those were the days when India was considering itself to be non-aligned. But now if we look at it, 
One could argue that India is aligning itself much more with the United States, and the United States is giving a very good quid pro quo. For example, many of the arrangements which prevented some of the military things from military technology from being exported to India have now been lifted for India. Absolutely. And I don't think alignment is a difficult word in New Delhi today. I don't think it's been a difficult terminology conceptually or otherwise for the last one, one and a half decades. And I don't think we should shy away from alignment. India is aligned with the United States in greater number of ways, not just in the military sphere, but also in technology. But there's a difference between an alignment, alignment of ideas, an alignment of con concepts, and an alliance. And that difference is very important to Indian leaders. And I don't think we're going to see a alliance structure which puts India in a corner, if that's what you mean, anytime in the near future. It would be unrealistic to think that India could beat China over a border issue. I don't think there's anyone, Lin, in India who is at the decision-making level who A, thinks that there is parity between India and China. Nobody believes that. Everybody accepts that Chinese material parity is just much higher than India's. On domestic consumption, on per capita income, they're at $10,000, we're at $1,800 in terms of military capabilities, in terms of a domestic base for consumption and so on and so forth. That's point number one. Point number two, I'm not sure. I think the smart bet that this government has placed is in fact not to invest in some kind of a zero sum game with China because they know they're gonna lose, whether it's on the BRI, whether it's in terms of infrastructure. People often talk about India and China being two nuclear powers, but hopefully these are two nuclear powers that will never use their might and definitely not against each other. At least the rest of us in Asia would certainly hope that. Do you think they ever will? No. I mean, I can never say no. No analyst and no historian can ever predict the future. But I think general trends go, we're not looking at a major military blowout between India and China. And that's primarily because there are people on both sides of this very long contested boundary that do keep a larger strategic landscape in mind. Having said that, what I do think will happen is we'll see a lot more skirmishes on the line of actual control between India and China. That's gonna be very different um, to the nature of the boundary in the last 30 to 40 years. I think you will see opportunities for escalation. You will see more permanent deployments of Indian troops on the boundary with China. And that's primarily because the trust has now completely eroded. There is no trust. So you're talking about a much more belligerent relationship much more belligerent, a much more kinetic relationship between the two sides. And I think over time, they will have to figure out a way in which they're able to manage these skirmishes, which are going to increase. It's just, in many ways, it's natural theory. If you have more troops on a boundary where you've not had troops before, and those troops come from very different thinking, anything can spark off a skirmish. You have to find newer mechanisms to stabilize those circumstances. We had a mechanism for about 10, 15 years. It worked, but it has run its course. Now we need newer mechanisms. And to a certain extent, and to go back to the US question, the boundary is India's problem. It may get some help from friendly countries through satellite images, but it's India's problem. And I think India understands that completely. You're not gonna have German or French or Japanese or Australian troops fighting India's wars, and they shouldn't fight India's wars. But I think what will happen is, Part of this restructuring of balance on the boundary will require India to do more with the Quad in the Indo-Pacific to keep that pressure on China. This is not to say that the pressure in the Indo-Pacific is gonna solve the boundary issue, not at all, but it adds a degree of pressure on China, which is unquestionable.
so are we looking at a low point in India-China relations, as some say? Absolutely. I think it is a low point, but it's a low point because of the actions that were taken by the PLA on an Indian boundary. It was a low point because there was a betrayal of trust that was garnered and that was invested for the last 10 years. If you look at the India-China relationship, you can draw a thread between 1988, when the first major thought took place in the relationship, almost till 2017, when the so-called Doklam clash happened on Bhutanese territory. But so I think for these various reasons, it is a low point. It will take time to reset in a sense, but I don't think it will reset in the same way as it did in the last two decades. We're going to see a complete restructuring of India-China relations, and a lot of this will be in turn shaped by the future of US-China relations. Well, China, of course, argues that the border clashes are because of India. In fact, that it is incursions by Indian troops that have caused all of this. But let's look also at what uh, China has been saying recently. The Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi has been saying that relations between China and India can be rivals, but you don't have to be enemies. Is that possible? I don't think there's a contradiction there with the way many in India see the relationship. I can't, of course, speak for the government. I don't know what their internal thinking is. But by and large, I don't think there's a contradiction there. Um, but I think the threshold of for stability for Chinese leaders is very different for the threshold today for what stability means for India. And what do I mean by that? In, in my own one-on-ones with various Chinese academics um, and others, there is this abstract idea in their mind that the border is some kind of a localized issue, which should not, according to them, affect strategic relations. I think they are living in a different universe with that conceptualization because that is not the universe for India. The border is a political issue today. It's a domestic political issue. What happened on the border in the summer of 2020 affected the nation as a whole. In fact, I think that even in today's India, if the political leadership would want to design some kind of structured rapprochement with China, it'll come under a lot of domestic political pressure. Well, that's interesting. Why is it that in India, it has still this incredible visceral feeling that gets people out onto the streets demonstrating, whereas you say that you feel in China, it has a much less emotive response. Why has India maintained this sensation, even though it's actually been, well, decades at least, as you say, since that last clash in the 1960s? That's even before you were born. You know, Lynn, I'll give you an answer in two ways. So one, um, just from a political structure perspective, the answer is because India is a democracy. It's chaotic. It's argumentative. It's got representation of people who have all sorts of ideological moorings. Um, and there is space for that kind of expression to come out onto the streets, unlike China. So that's number one. But number two, and this is a larger question, which is a more parochial answer, perhaps. I mean, if I take my own mother, for instance, I remember I was with my mother when we were watching these Galwan clashes. For that generation, this really matters. It goes straight back to the 1960s in many respects. And it is that there is that generation that also sits in many of the seats in the Indian parliament. So that connection to history is important. And for many Chinese scholars, it's very difficult for them in a very rational, objective way to try and understand that. And Galwan was the lightning rod that broke the trust that had been invested despite the historical baggage of the past. I think that's the important point. What about a young analyst like you? Do you feel that both on an intellectual level as well as on this emotive level? Do you think it has that resonance? Does that no, border mean that much to you? Not necessarily, but I think what does matter to me, even for those in my generation, for instance, so I think there were many in my generation who would have invested and supported a stronger resilient relationship with China, despite the troubles on the boundary. And we would have all kind of put our bets into this rapprochement that took place from the late 1980s till about 2017. But I think what happened last year in many respects demonstrated to many of us that that reciprocity is not there on the Chinese side. The number of Chinese diplomats today who are 48, 52 years old. Their conceptualization of trust, I think, is just very different to the kind of bets that were placed by many in India of a younger generation 
into China. And I, and I can tell you is I have friends who are in industry, business, technology. What happened in the border matters to them. They're not interested in investing in China any longer. They're not interested in attracting Chinese venture capital funds or working with Chinese startups any longer. It has had an effect across generations. Even if it would damage their business, you're saying? I think even if it would damage their business. I think today there is a sense that there is a, the argument is for many of these technologists is that the short-term gain or rather the short-term loss in the loss of relationship with their counterparts in China ought to be made up down the line with a reorientation of new partners, new friends in Europe, in the ASEAN, in the United States, um, creating less risky ventures, um, which to be honest, the Chinese could have done a lot better job of to stabilize. Let me look at ASEAN and India and ASEAN and China. ASEAN became China's biggest trading partner last year, which has never been before. So that's going to be really tough for India to try and, well, to rival in any way. So are Indian companies and ASEAN companies really going to be hooking up when it's obvious that ASEAN and Chinese companies are really working together incredibly? That's a really good question. And I think a lot more needs to be done on the Indian end to work with ASEAN partner states. There's a very nice framework. There's a very good structure. India struck its first treaty agreement, if you like, with ASEAN back in 1992. Today, it's what's called a strategic partner. It has many different forums in which the economic relationship can be enabled. But having said that, I think the Indian government needs to do more in bilaterally engaging countries like Vietnam, for instance. And I can tell you there are many ASEAN countries, many of their missions based here in Delhi, who I meet all the time, who are very open to doing much more with India bilaterally. They want to invest in India. They want to do co-production of chip making or semiconductors or high-end technology between certain ASEAN countries and India. So I think the government needs to do a lot more to arrest this moment, also arrest the moment of diversification out of China, which at the moment is focused very much on ASEAN, Thailand, Vietnam, and try and bring some of that into India. And that is an urgent need. And that is a place where ASEAN countries can work alongside India. Having said that, the one question, I, one point I will make is of course, ASEAN member states as a whole, and perhaps because of their history, also are a tie between the US and China. I think there is a fight for neutrality that countries, nation states like Singapore, for instance, right, is faced with every single day. And I think India is very mindful of that. And that does provide a bridge of understanding. What about RCEP? It's a massive trade agreement. Some would call it Beijing-led. India has decided it's not going to be part of it. Is India actually wise in doing that, in cutting itself out from this big trade agreement? I think there were very strong domestic compulsions um, for a variety of reasons not to enter into RCEP. There is a competition question that needs to be considered on this particular issue. If you ask me is down the line, will India consider RCEP? I hope so. I hope down the line it's not too late. And I hope down the line, for instance, um, there can be a, a better domestic structure which allows India to consider not just trade, trade deals with RCEP, but larger trade deals, say, with Europe. So for me, for instance, a FTA with Europe, uh, which is, again, a free trade agreement, would be enormous for, for many sectors in India, from textiles, potentially to automobiles and others. But I think there is a domestic question also about competition. But my hope is that there is a little bit more focus on free trade agreements as a whole. And I do believe that in the next couple of years, 
we will see some kind of a deal with the European Union, with Australia, with the United Kingdom, and I hope in some form and shape with ASEAN, either through the RCEP or some other kind of mechanism. Australia's former Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, is saying that the answer to every question that you have about China is India. Do you agree? So I read Tony Abbott's piece. Um, he was out in India. Um, and, I read, I, and he's obviously one of the big champions of the FTA between Australia and India. I'm not sure that's the right conceptualization. And I think in a sense, if Australia, Japan, the United States, and other parts of the world set up the India story as a backstop to everything that you can't do with China or what you should not do with China, I think it will add pressures bilaterally and quadrilaterally that frankly are unnecessary. I think India has to be seen for what India is and for the promise that it holds and for the abilities that it holds. It should not be seen as a real estate, a strategic real estate that should be expected to do what China can't or what Australia no longer wants to do with China. So I think that balance will get, get, get sorted out in the next couple of years. It'll happen through the Quad. It'll happen through other mechanisms. But I hope very much that this thinking doesn't overpower these negotiations, conversations, and informal discussions. It will just add a bit too much pressure um, on India, frankly. Ruta Chowdhury, thank you very much for being on In Conversation. Lynn, thank you so much for having me. Goodbye.